Okay, so we ended with um, the gambler's fallacy. So talking about how um, people think that if something, probably they think of probability as this long range idea, or if something hasn't happened, the likelihood of it happening goes up. Um, and in reality, the likelihood of it happening stays the same. So we've got to think of probability as an independent thing from each event is a separate thing. Um, you can think about probability as what's the likelihood of getting three heads, right? So that's tied to three events. We're mostly working with what's the likelihood of this thing. Um, so probability, what we're going to talk about is the likelihood of a single event independent of other events occurring um, out of all the possible options. So I mean independent of like if mom has three boys, what's the probability of another boy? You gotta ignore the first three boys. So it would be half, right? So I got two different options. That's the likelihood of all events, and then we would pick one of them. So the overall national probability of left-handedness is 10 to 15 percent. So how many lefties we got? Two of us. Just me and you. Okay. So two out of 19 is about 10 percent. So. Um, that's the number of total events happening over the number of possible events. Okay. Um, and that's why it's hard to estimate left-handedness. Um, and the probability is actually going up because we are uh, now at generations where it wasn't a weird thing to be left-handed and they didn't force people to change hands. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of ways to interpret probability. And we do a little bit of this uh, subjective interpretation, personal probability. That's actually one of the things that I made you do for this exam. I'll give you those results at the end of the semester. Um, but subjective inter uh, interpretation, so personal probability, it's your judgment of the likelihood of something happening. And I will warn you, we are very bad at these things. Now you tell me, right? Um, so judgments of, of probability are particularly poor. Otherwise, no one would ever gamble. Um, and that's how people get good at things like poker, because they, they're thinking in terms of probability. And uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, they had was either Radio Lab or Freakonomics recently a podcast about with one of the famous poker families and their interpretations of probability and why they're so good at playing poker. <laughs> Um, but as a researcher, we're supposed to move towards objective interpretations. Um, and so that's a relative long-term outcome. So I'm thinking, like, if I did this study 100 times, how many times would I get this result? And so it's the likelihood of after testing it multiple times. So the difference really between the two is this is a personal estimate. Uh, so what's the likelihood of your friend being late? Okay. And you, you just have a guess at this. Like, you're either never late or always late somewhere in the middle. Okay. Um, objective interpretation is if I followed them around and counted how many times they were late. Okay. So these are more estimates. We're really bad at it. We shouldn't do this. And these are more objective counting sorts of things. Okay. Otherwise, no one would play the lottery. Because right? objectively, they tell you what the odds are. Okay. Uh, so how do we do the objective part? So we would take all the trials, all the times we would test something, the outcomes of the trials, so the likelihood of success, that's the thing where you get what you're looking for, all the total number of trials. So likelihood of successful outcomes over total trials. This might be a little old now. This was happening the last time I taught this class. Uh, the Amanda Knox case where she got convicted, I think, twice in Italy and once overturned, and it's a huge mess with the Italian court. So two-thirds probability of being convicted. Um, she's back in the States, and we won't send her back because we don't believe in double jeopardy. Okay. So all the different trials, um, and I guess they would consider that two times a success. <laughs> so when you're doing this on, this seems like really obvious, but sometimes people struggle with this. So when you're doing this on your homework, um, you figure out how many total trials are there, and that's the denominator. And then figure out the number of times they get what they're looking for, so a success. So when people talk about um, win-loss ratios for sports teams, that's just probability. Um, so they figure out the likelihood of, you know, like how many times does 
um, Alabama beaten LSU at this particular way. Right. <coughs> so the number of trials that I've beaten them, and then you just divide. Um, but the thing that trips people up on all this is independence. And this is where the gambler's fallacy comes back in. So the outcome of each individual trial is unrelated to previous trials. So independence is sort of the opposite of the gambler's fallacy. Uh, and we believe that our research experiments are independent events and that people are independent. So the outcome of you know, your results in the exam is unrelated to the outcome of your friend's results on the exam. Well, it's cheating, then it's not independent anymore, right? Um, and so we believe that things are independent. Like, that's one of the big assumptions that we have, that, uh, is that people's scores are independent from each other. Question? Yeah. What about, like, <clears throat> in a game of poker where, depending on what cards have already been drawn, you, like, it affects the pulling, like, the thing you're pulling from to get probability. Right. Do they use more than one deck, or is it just black deck? I think it's just black deck. It's just black deck. So well, poker, each trial is not independent uh -huh. because then the, the, the denominator is changing with each. Yeah. That's part of the math. That's what makes it so difficult to determine the probability. Right. Just like um, with uh, uh, each game, though, is independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So that makes sense. Uh, like with uh, the lottery, each draw of a ball is not independent because the likelihood of each ball gets higher because mm -hmm. they, they don't replace them. Yeah. Um, but each drawing is independent. So if it drew six this time, the odds of six are the same as next time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you have to, in that sense, the, sometimes independence isn't a thing. But with participants, we really hope they're independent, that your scores are unrelated to other people's scores. Now, your scores are related to you, so you take exam one, you take exam two, like there's this ability level, so I have to control for the fact that you're going to have multiple exams if I'm testing that. Um, but uh, that is easy to control for. But we expect that trials are independent, so kind of think of it as games. Um, where the gambler's fallacy is the likelihood of something increases if it hasn't happened, which is not true. What does this got to do with stats? <clears throat> so we're going to move into hypothesis testing. The first couple of times that you do this, it'll be kind of like, what is going on? We'll get you the hang of it. And so we're going to take those rules of probability and use it to test our hypotheses. Uh, and we're going to use those probabilities to make decisions, although it will seem quite backwards. Okay. What we're going to do. <laughs> so the first thing that you want to think about with a hypothesis is just sort of developing um, what are my variables and what are the levels of those variables if we're going to use um, nominal variables? <clears throat> so similar to the way we talked about graphs, we have to come up with what are the variables. Okay. So we might have one variable that's got a control group and experimental group. Remember that levels is just what are the groups. And then we're measuring the differences in their scores. Or I might have two um, uh, continuous variables that I want to correlate. We're going to start most of these with very simple, like this group versus that group. That's the easiest way to think about it. Okay. And then when we do that, we're going to create two hypotheses. And I think this is a stupid marker, but we'll try. So we're going to have a null hypothesis and a research hypothesis. Oh, no, it's not. Yay. Oh, this is where P comes from. <laughs> yes. I understand now. <laughs> Yeah, we're getting there slowly. <clears throat> so the null hypothesis, remember that null means zero. So and nothing happened. So you might say that there's no difference between groups or levels. You might say there's no relationship between variables. So it always has a no in there somewhere. No differences, no relationship, nothing happened. Life is sad. Okay. So this is often you don't want this. Because you're doing a research study for a reason, and you generally want groups to be different or related. So this is kind of our bad, bad hypothesis. It's not a bad hypothesis. I won't say that. It's the one we don't want to have happen. For the research hypothesis, sometimes this is called the alternative hypothesis, depending on what book you're reading. So if you see alternative, this the same idea. We'll 
we're gonna call it research hypothesis. This is the one where it's the, the thing you want to have happened. So something happened. And this is good. Yay. There are always two. You can have more, but there are always two. Why two? Because reasons in a second. But essentially, we're going to test this one. Yay. We don't actually test the other one. We're like, it's like Sherlock Holmes. Um, what we're going to do is test if nothing happened. And if that's incorrect, so this is almost a double negative. If not nothing, then something. And so I always think about it like Sherlock Holmes because it's like, you're ruling out other explanations so that this has to be true. So I'm going to rule out that nothing happened to say that something did happen. It's actually a little similar to the way a police work works. So first they have to determine that something happened, and then they rule out people. Right? It's easier to rule them out than to prove that they're guilty. So we start by ruling people out, and then we work on proving the research. But we're not going to do that. Um, now, with these hypotheses, sometimes you might predict a direction. I expect this group to be larger than this other group, or I expect this group to be smaller. But we're going to do that more later. Right now, we just want you to get the idea that there's one that says nothing happened, and there's one that says something happened. And we'll work out how that works in a little bit. <coughs> and I have an example in here of one of these setups. If I'm trying to make a decision, so I have my two hypotheses. Now I want to make a decision about what happened in my study. There's two options. I can reject the null and can say it's not true, it's unlikely. I can conclude that I found a difference. This is when somebody says it's statistically significant is the fancy phrase, okay, which is just difficult to say, so I don't know why we use it. So I'm rejecting the null to show that this is true. Or I can fail to reject the null it's not statistically significant, which is sort of like, I don't know what happened. So if we reject the null, we're saying that this thing is totally unlikely, it's probably not true, therefore, this thing is true. So we don't ever, we create a research hypothesis, but we never actually test it, which is very confusing to people at first. Um, nor do we ever prove the research hypothesis, so don't use the word proof. Um, or disprove it. It's just there. It's like your friend hanging out in the room. So we're going to reject the null. Uh, there is, this is unlikely, therefore this is true. Or fail to reject the null, therefore I'm not sure what happened. This might be true, this might be true, but in our study we don't have any evidence to support doing something about it. And this is back to that file drawer effect. So when people fail to reject the null, you don't really know what happens. Like, I didn't find a difference. Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe you have outliers. Maybe something's weird. Maybe there is no difference. So there's almost too many options. So people just don't publish that stuff because it's unclear what happened. <coughs> Why is it all about the null? I don't know. Okay, but it is called null, sig null hypothesis significance testing. Ugh. So if you ever see NHST, they're talking about this system where I set up two hypotheses, but I'm all about I'm rejecting and accepting the null. Not accepting, failing to reject at all. <laughs> all right. Um, and then this is just a cute little table that summarizes everything I had. But you'll notice that I never actually accept anything. So if you're working on those multiple choice and it says accept the whatever, that's automatically just a filler answer. So we never accept anything. We reject it or we fail to reject it, and those are the only words we use. So let me give you an example. Um, so we did a study a while back uh, looking at attendance and pass. So pass your assisted study sessions. You should have had a gen ed class with them, or if you're in anatomy and physiology, they have those classes. Um, but essentially, we hire somebody who has taken the course and done really well in it, and then they offer study sessions. Um, Intro to Psych was designed in a similar way. We're trying to see if uh, having those study sessions is going to lower the DFW rate. Y'all know what DFWs are. Yeah. I always explain this to other professors. They're like, what do you mean DFW rate? I'm like, really? You teach classes. 
people who make D's and F's or withdraw. Uh, and we're trying to lower that for hard courses because we want to retain students because we want them to finish. Believe it or not, um, you may not believe that while you take anatomy, but they do want you to finish and graduate. <clears throat> so we can code this as a session of attendance. Did you go or not? This is not quite how we did it. We did it as continuous. How many times did you go? But we could make it yes or no. That would make it a nominal variable. And then we use DFW rate as a percent. Percent, no one could fail. So it has a ratio scale because it's got a zero. That means nobody. So we've got this kind of traditional control group versus not set up. So they either didn't go or they did. And then we're seeing if they have differences in their DFW rate. So I'm going to set this up as a null hypothesis test. I would say there's no difference. So you see this is the null, so it says nothing happened in DFW rates. So pass doesn't work. Nothing happened. People still fail at the same rate. The sort of simpler way to write that is like this. So you can write on your um, quizzes and stuff, you can write them like this. No sessions equal to but you'll see, if you look at how I wrote this, it has the IV and the DV in it. So it says between the two IV groups, there's no change in the DV. So it's going to have both IVs and DVs in here, and it'll really help if you kind of start by writing them out so you can kind of see what's going on. <clears throat> All right. A research hypothesis it says there is a difference. Okay. Something happened. Maybe they're going to do worse because the people who go to sessions might be the people who are really struggling and they might still fail because they waited too long to go. Or maybe they're going to do better because the sessions really work. I'm not sure. So it could actually make session, it could actually make DFW rates worse, but in the sense of like these are the people who are struggling who really need to go. That's not how it works. Um, what tends to happen is the, the smart kids go. Um, or maybe it'll make it better. So I didn't predict a direction. I just said something's going to happen. We'll see. So I can write that as not equal to. Right. So I've got my nothing happened and something happened. And then I would test that. So let me show you a table from our study. Okay, BMS courses. So this is never, and this is at least once. Um, it gets better the more you go, because you're studying more shock. Right. But if you look at never attended a class, the DFW rate is 40. Anatomy, physiology, <coughs> and intro to EMS, the one ten. If you go to at least one, the DFW rate is only twenty percent. So drop twenty percent. That's a lot of students in a lot in these courses. Okay. Uh, with the chemistry too, I forget exactly which chemistry courses, but I believe organic is in there. So the other big weed out class for the DMS is C A and B majors, right? Um, so it drops half as well. Economics, so that's macroeconomics, 150, what is that? Five, I think. Yeah. Um, and they were a little surprised because they didn't feel like economics was working, but it does drop as well. And then psych, that we used to be this course before it became an honors course. Um, and so 200, and it drops quite a lot. And we have the help desk now since we don't do pass. Um, so it does work. Yay, yay. So if you have, if you have a pass in your class, you should go. Um, but that was really a nice way to show that it was working so they would keep giving up money. <laughs> and then the fun part is that, oh, I have it listed as SI. SI is what uh, most people call it. We call it PASS. And I actually was an SI leader a million years ago as well. So partially I'm interested because I used to do this. <clears throat> so I would reject the null. It was significant. But I think I have examples of both here. So if I rejected the null, I'm supporting the idea there's a difference in DFW rates for pass. And mainly it's a decrease, just looking at the results. I predicted something would happen. So, and then I look at it and I say, okay, the scores are going down. That's good in this case. If I had failed to reject the null, though, so let's say nothing happened, I failed to find a difference. So I don't support the research hypothesis. But that may be because the sample is weird. Maybe we had a semester that just the sample was strange. Um, maybe there really isn't a difference between P 
people who go and people who don't go. And maybe it's chance. Okay, so there's always that little bit of chance. Chance is the catch-all phrase for um, random things that happen in life. Right? So I have a magnet in my office. This is random error happens as a nerdy stats joke. But this is the chance part. Sometimes things, you have no idea why. <clears throat> I look at the difference between these two. So if I fail, if I reject the null, I'm supporting the research. Right. If I fail to reject the null, I'm basically saying, I don't know what happened. It could be this or this or this or this, but I don't know about this. Okay. One thing that people do that's incorrect is if they fail to reject the null, they say the null is true. And that's not how this works. Okay. So if you fail to reject the null, the null could be true, the research could be true, we're not sure. So we don't have enough evidence to make a decision, really. Yeah. Can't you also like reject, more fully reject the null, and like, Meaning. like can't you have like different amounts of reject? Like you could say it's more mm. probable that no. Uh, with null hypothesis testing, it's very black and white thinking. Okay. You reject or you don't. When we get into effect size, that's when we're going to talk about how much should I care. Okay. So there's another right. piece that measures that how much. Okay. <clears throat> That's one people problem people have with uh, NHST and the null hypothesis testing is that it is very black and white, and we all know the world is not like that. But the hypothesis testing is like, here's my line in the sand, I reject it or I don't. <clears throat> so back to what does that got to do with probability? You started with probability, why are we, what, what's going on? Okay. We're determining this rejection thing based on probabilities. And this is where people are like, what is going on? So we want, to, it's null hypothesis testing. So we're testing the null, but we don't want the null to be true because of the sad frowny face. So if we don't want this to be true, we want the probability of it being true to be really small. So we want small probabilities, which is backwards. You normally think like, I want to be, like kind of your question, like I want to be really sure I'm right. But this is null backwards testing. The way I think about it. So we want to test if the null is true, so we want a small probability. So we use P for probability. So that the probability of the null is really unlikely. Okay. So basically we're testing what's the probability of this thing? We want it to be really small, which means that it's really unlikely, so this thing must be true. <coughs> I used to joke that this was Rock'em Sock'em Robots. I use that example in my other class. And we're trying to say that the likelihood of this thing winning is very small. If you like sports, these analogies make sense. You know, like so much in the sports, I don't know. Sports are great examples. But we want the likelihood of something happening to be really small. Um, and that leads me into this little table I'm going to make. Has ever got this thing on the board? Yeah. So I'm testing the null. So I'm going to draw this as square. I might have it in the notes. Nope. I lie. I don't. So let's draw it. Here is us as little researchers with our little goggles. Right. <clears throat> I don't ever wear goggles, but I feel like people think the researchers is the white coat goggles thing. Um, and so we're going to either fail to reject a null or reject a null. So this is our decision. Somehow, magically, we know the real answer. So we either fail to reject the null or we reject. So the way people talk about type 1 and type 2 here in a second is they make up fake studies where they know what the answer is and then test how many times people get the wrong answer. So this is sort of like battleship. Right? So um, they know where the right pieces are supposed to go and then you're guessing. So they look at how many times you miss, how many times you hit, that sort of thing. Um, now, when you run your own real research study, uh, you don't really know the real answer. You're trying to figure it out. So this is sort of, uh, this, this two slides are ideas about like not making mistakes, 
But if it's a real study, you won't necessarily know. All right. So type 1 error, these are terrible names, okay, but that's what they're called. So a type 1 error is sometimes called a sin of commission. It's when you reject the null, so we chose to reject, but we weren't supposed to. Rejecting the null hypothesis in the yeah. Uh, so we weren't supposed to here. It's called alpha. So we did reject, but we weren't supposed to. Um, the way I remember this one is a silly mnemonic. It's the first mistake, so type one, is the worst mistake. Because that's when you say something happened and it didn't. So if you say something happened and it didn't, then people are going to base their research on that, and they're going to follow this line of research that didn't actually, wasn't supported. Okay. Uh, this is very similar to that autism debate where the first study, the big one, everybody cites that has since been retracted, and he said, oh, I made it up. First mistake is the worst mistake. Most of our social science research doesn't have those sorts of con consequences, but that's a really very good example of a type one problem. Okay. Actually, he was just freaking lying. But let's pretend that he wasn't <laughs> for a second. Um, and he said something happened and it didn't. <clears throat> it's not always malicious. Okay. Type two is when we decide um, we failed to reject the null, but we should have. So here. This is beta. So we missed it. So type two is a miss. There's something there, but you missed it. It's just it's an omission um, because you omitted it. And so you say nothing happened when it did. We don't consider these quite as problematic. Uh, we, well, they, at least it's like this is the biggest problem. Like we don't want to say things happen when they didn't. If we miss something, it's unfortunate, but it doesn't tend to get published, so we don't like, you know, you missed it. Okay. So it's sort of, uh, we find these much worse than these. Okay. Those are probably the hardest things when they're applied. So it'll give you some examples uh, in the quizzes. And so just kind of reason it out. They say something happened and it didn't, or they didn't, they missed something that should have happened. Is the way I always think about them. <clears throat> um, let me finish filling this in. We're actually going to cover this next part in another section, but I want to go ahead and finish this table. Okay. If you fail to reject the null and you were supposed to, you get a happy face. This doesn't have a name. So there's nothing there. And there's nothing there. So good job. You got it right. This box, though, is called power. That's when you rejected the null and you were supposed to. You found the thing that was there. Yay, so that's the happy box. So this is like a mildly unhappy box because you failed to reject something you weren't supposed to reject, which is good. You got it right statistically, but your study you just have the wrong idea. This other one's called power. So I rejected the null when I was supposed to, so I had the power, oh, I have the power to find the thing I'm looking for. One problem people have is they think type one and type two are opposites. They are not opposites. They're different in different columns. Okay. Uh, they sound like opposites, but they're not. Okay. Power and beta are opposites. These two are on a seesaw, but they're not opposites. All right, so the prevalence of type 1 errors are more likely to be found in journals for reasons this kind of comes back to the Fowler effect. So we're much more likely to result positive outcomes, meaning times that we rejected the null. So basically, this is the column that gets reported in journals. This stuff doesn't. Right, so type 2 errors just happen in the lab and you throw it away. Type 1 errors get published sometimes. And so um, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between when it's power and people found what they were looking for and it's type one. 
and that goes back to that study of uh, reading people's minds versus the um, bystander effect. So we do have ways to test if a type one error happened in that file drawer issue. Um, they're um, much more math than you probably ever want to know, but uh, we do have ways to tell which one is which. No, we're not always right because uh, humans. But type one error is one thing that people really struggle to make sure we don't have happen. All right, and I think that effect size thing to answer your question is in a like six or six, one of the next chapters. Okay. But we will get into how much should I believe these results? Like, okay, I rejected the null. Now what? We'll get into that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, did you think of rejecting the null?